My name is Janice Hume. I am the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication, and we're thrilled that you're all here. Um, for more than four decades, the Grady College has welcomed notable journalists um, uh, to the University of Georgia to honor, uh, as McGill lectures, to honor Ralph McGill's uh, t uh, tenure as, as an editor. Uh, Ralph McGill was regarded as the conscience of the American South for his editorials in the Atlanta Constitution, challenging racial segregation in the 1950s and the 1960s. In 2007, we added the McGill Symposium, bringing together students, faculty, and journalists to consider what journalistic courage means and how it is exemplified by reporters and editors. At today's 15th McGill Symposium, leading professionals from across the country joined 12 McGill Fellows, students selected by a faculty committee for their strengths in academics, practical experience, and leadership um, for a remarkable and inspiring day devoted to journalistic courage. You'll meet these year, this year's fellows in just a few minutes. Um, our heartfelt thanks to today's symposium professionals, Daniel Funky, who is here somewhere, there he is, yay. Uh, digital investigation editor at AFP and a Grady and McGill program alumnus. Frank Lamonte, is Frank here? Uh, who is counsel for CNN, oh, he's, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Camille Whitaker, co-founder of Canopy Atlanta and, uh, and also a Grady MFA alumnus. And today's lecturer, renowned photojournalist, Lindsay Adario. In 2009, we expanded the program yet again at, uh, when we awarded the first McGill Medal to a US journalist whose career has exemplified journalistic courage. This year's class of McGill's fellows selected the 2023 McGill Medal recipient based on nominations submitted by journalists, journalism educators throughout the country. Uh, now for the fun part, let me introduce this year's class of McGill Fellows, and when I call your name, please come forward and receive your graduation honor cord. Victoria Adkins. Yay! Skyly Alvarez. Martina Essert. Taft Gant. Jacqueline, Jacqueline Ganon, Cassidy Hedesheimer, Aaron Kinney, Sophie Ralph, Elizabeth Ramirez, Audrey Apus, Melanie Velasquez, and Sierra Walker. These are awesome students, and let's give them all another big round of applause for the work that they've done. Also, I'd like to say a special thank you to the faculty in the Grady College who have given their time this year to help the McGill program succeed. Dodie Cantrell Bickley, Keith Herndon, um, yours truly, Mark Johnson, Vicki Michaelis, John Peters, and especially to Diane Murray, um, who directs our McGill program for journalistic courage. Let's give Diane a big round of applause. <laughs> and now it is my great pleasure to introduce Skyly Alvarez, uh, representing the McGill Fellows class to present the medal. Lindsay Adario is an American photojournalist who has been covering humanitarian crises and women's issues around the world for more than two decades. Since September 11, 2001, Adario has reported on conflicts in countries such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Lebanon, Syria, and the ongoing war in Ukraine. In 2015, American Photo Magazine named Lindsay as one of five most influential photographers of the past 25 years, saying she has changed the way we saw the world's conflicts. Adario's commitment to shedding greater light on global crises is admirable. Her nuanced documentary work has navigated topics from maternal morality to the effects of war on children to climate change. She treats each of her stories with great care, and her selection for the McGill Medal could not be more well-deserved. 
On behalf of the 2023 McGill Fellows, I'm honored to present this year's McGill Medal for Journalistic Courage to Lindsay Adario, and I introduce her as the McGill Lecturer. Great, well, thank you so much for the incredible honor. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say because I don't think of myself as very courageous. I think of the people I cover as incredibly courageous. So I really appreciate it, thank you. I'll get started uh, right away. So a lot of people ask me why I decided to become a war photographer. And I always start with this photograph because uh, I was raised the youngest of four sisters. And uh, anyone who has older sisters knows what that means. <laughs> it made me very tough, let's just say. Uh, this is a very 1970s picture, so it definitely dates me. I'm the one smack in the middle with little ponytails. In uh, 2000, I moved to India, and I had been working for the Associated Press in New York uh, in the 90s, and I really wanted to move overseas. So I moved to India, and I wanted to cover women's issues. It was something that had interested me for a while. And I had been reading the New York Times about the situation for women living in Afghanistan under the Taliban, and this was the first time the Taliban was in power. And I decided I wanted to go. And of course, I had uh, no experience in a hostile country. I didn't realize that women were not allowed to leave the home without a male, uh, a mahram. And I had about $12 in the bank. So I called my sister and I asked her to wire me money to go to Afghanistan. And then I, I called um, a few contacts with the United Nations that my roommate at the time had given me and uh, some landmine organizations. And my goal was to sort of use their infrastructure to help me move around the country. And very luckily they offered to do so. So this was, um, I went in and this was really my first experience in a country where women had no rights. And the only women on the streets were widows. Uh, they were the only women who could work at the time. And uh, this is how they worked. They begged in the streets. And a woman at home would come in, she would take off her hijab at home, but out on the streets uh, and in public places, she remained covered. I realized in Afghanistan uh, under the Taliban that my, my gender was actually an asset. It was something that allowed me to get into women's spaces. And I was always seen as a sort of third sex as a woman journalist in Afghanistan, because I was also allowed into spaces where men were, um, but I was allowed to go into spaces where women were, and the Taliban didn't enter there. So this is a women's hospital in Afghanistan, and this is a woman in labor uh, under the Taliban in Afghanistan, and many of the medical professionals had fled. Most educated people had fled when the Taliban came to power, and also uh, during so many years of war. There were very brave Afghan families at the time. This is in 2000, so this is before September 11th. Um, I ended up making three trips to Afghanistan under the Taliban, and I, I started to recognize all these brave families who were opening secret girls' schools for girls to get educated under the Taliban because education of girls was illegal. And I also realized uh, one day I was working with a driver and we were covering the drought and he said he had to go because his brother was getting married. And I was sort of fascinated by the idea of what a wedding looked like under the Taliban where all forms of entertainment was illegal. And so I asked him if I could come. And when we arrived, we had to walk into this gated house and into a, a, a sort of cement structure and down these stairs. And the soundtrack for the Titanic was blasting. And it was incredible. There were men and women dancing with makeup and all of these things were illegal under the Taliban. But it made me realize in the future, I had to look for these very private moments. So it really set the tone for my career. I went back after September 11th for the fall of the Taliban. This is in Kandahar. And then I started going back almost every year for the past 20 years and started photographing women gaining their rights back. So this is women participating in elections uh, at the soccer stadium, uh, women graduating from the University of Literature from Kabul University, uh, a wedding, 
women boxing team, all of these things obviously were huge strides from when I first started going and women basically couldn't leave the house. This is Trina. She was an actress and we drove around together in Kabul. A woman journalist. She was a TV presenter. This is Fauzia Kufi, a parliamentarian, very outspoken, big advocate for women's rights and women learning to do fistula surgery at the hospital. Women police, a lot of these women were widows. They were wi they were uh, women whose husbands were either very open to having them work as police women, or they were women who had no husbands. And this is the women's prison. Um, the women's prison in Kabul, or all across Afghanistan, the women's prisons were full of women, who many of whom didn't deserve to be in prison. This is Maida Hall, and she was put in prison because she asked for a divorce from her husband, because she was so exhausted taking care of him, a much older man. And women turned to suicide. When things got very bad and very difficult, a lot of women turned to suicide because they had no other place to go. Women couldn't ask for a divorce. And this was even after the Taliban fell. It's a deeply conservative culture, and it's frowned upon if a woman had too much freedom. And now, of course, we've seen the Taliban has come back, and so many of the rights that they gained, basically all of the rights that women gained in the last 20 years have been stripped away immediately in the past two years. In 2003, it was clear our country was gearing up for the war in Iraq, and I wanted to be there. Uh, I still hadn't covered combat, so I wasn't sure I'd be able to cover actual combat, but I wanted to go. And so I went and I waited in northern Iraq until Saddam Hussein fell. And there were these incredible scenes of euphoria, and there was the chaos after the fall of Saddam Hussein. There was a lot of looting around the country. People didn't have electricity. Uh, mass graves were unearthed around. This is south of Baghdad. And each one of these white sheets was the body of someone's loved one. And they were Shiites who were unable to mourn their loved ones uh, under Saddam Hussein, who was Sunni. And there were riots because people were so frustrated. They couldn't get propane for cooking. They couldn't get their money out of the banks. Uh, there was very little electricity. So while the U.S. had a plan to get rid of Saddam Hussein, there was no plan for sort of the aftermath and the, and the de facto government that they had to set up. And then the insurgency started. And it was uh, incredible to witness sort of the initial euphoria after Saddam Hussein fell almost immediately within months turn into chaos and turn into hatred for American troops for many reasons. And this is the Mahdi Army. This is one of the insurgent groups that rose up against the American forces. And I started doing my first military embeds in Iraq. And this is where I would go out in, with the Americans into the heart of the Sunni Triangle as they rounded up men and boys in the middle of the night. And they said they were suspicious or part of the insurgency. And often they put bags on their heads and zip ties on their wrist and brought them in for questioning. And this is uh, in right outside of Fallujah. And this was really one of the first times that I had ever been in a proper ambush. And I spent the first sort of 30 minutes of this so terrified I forgot to even take photographs. And so this is when I finally got to a position where I felt like I had some cover and was able to take some photographs. But it was, um, you know, people always say you're fearless and actually I'm terrified in a lot of these moments, but I just have to figure out how to channel my energy into my work and figure out how to photograph. In 2004, uh, we were gearing up for sort of the siege of Fallujah. And this is November, and there were so many wounded American soldiers coming out of the big battle of Fallujah that they they emptied out the inside of a C-71 car, uh, uh, cargo aircraft and put all of the wounded Marines on the ground. And this is how they were flown to Ramstein, Germany for treatment. And it was an extraordinary scene. Um, this was really one of the first times I had gotten access to wounded American soldiers. And I think really anyone had gotten access to wounded American soldiers. It was something that the US government was very um, strategic about not giving much access to the wounded and the dead. 
And so we got this access because the writer's grandfather and father were both medics in the military. And we spent about a week uh, covering the wounded coming out of Fallujah. And at the end, we flew with them to Ramstein. And I was so sure that when Life magazine, who commissioned this piece, when they when they published the photographs, the American public would have a better idea of the toll of the war in Iraq on the American soldiers. But um, I filed the pictures uh, in early November, or in kind of mid-November, and for four months, Life magazine held my photographs of wounded American soldiers. And at the end, in February, I got an email from my editor saying, we will never publish your pictures of wounded soldiers because we don't think the American public can handle them. And of course, I was furious because I said, how dare you send me to war if you don't have the guts to publish what I, what I see? And so I then went to the New York Times Magazine. And luckily, Kathy Ryan, who was the editor there, was able to get them into the magazine very soon after Life released the pictures. In 2007, I was working with Elizabeth Rubin for the New York Times Magazine, and we wanted to do a story on the most dangerous place in Afghanistan at the time and why there were so many civilian casualties if we had some of the best military technology in the world. And so we asked to go to the Korangal Valley. The public affairs officer sort of looked Elizabeth and I up and down and said, you know, it's not really a place that's meant for women. And we said, well, why not? And they said, well, there's no place for you to sleep and no place for you to go to the bathroom. And we said, well, that's weird. Where do the men sleep and where do the men go to the bathroom? And they said, okay, come back tomorrow. At that point in time, uh, the Pentagon and the Department of Defense did not want women on the front lines of war. Uh, but that rule did not apply to journalists. So they did allow us to go. We were very lucky. Colonel Oslan, who was the commander of the Korngal, um, had the, he believed in transparency. He believed that if the American public understood the nuances of war and how complicated his decisions were, that they would understand why there were civilian casualties, that they would understand how difficult decisions are in war. So we spent two months living with the troops on the side of a mountain in bunkers, going on long patrols every single day, often getting shot at, mortared. This is us under mortar fire. And at the end of the two months, we went on something called Operation Rock Avalanche. It was in the documentary Restrepo, and where we were airlifted onto the side of a mountain in one of the most hostile places in Afghanistan. It was in the heart of Taliban territory. And we had to jump out of helicopters hovering over about 10 feet off the ground, jump out of Blackhawks in the middle of the night. And everything was through night vision goggles. And so this is uh, after we had jumped out, we got word uh, through the, the tactical operations the command center, that the Taliban was very close by. We had to stop everything. And Captain Kearney, who was the commander on the ground, was deciding whether to call in an airstrike. For a photographer, it's very frustrating to be in a place where it's pitch black and there's nothing to photograph. So um, I fell asleep on the side of the mountain, as one does in war. You sleep when you can and when there's nothing to photograph. And then I woke up, Kearney said, we're sparkling. And I put my night vision over my camera lens, and this is what I saw. And what you're looking at is a laser beam that's visible only through night vision goggles. And, um, and this is how a JTAC, who's with the Air Force, walks an Air Force, walks an Air Force pilot onto a target. And because only the pilot and the soldiers can see this. And so I took a few photos and then I fell back asleep. And this is where we slept in this ditch for the first uh, three nights of the operation. And this is with the command group. And on the sixth day, we were ambushed by the Taliban. They hit us from three sides and three soldiers were shot and Sergeant Rugel was killed. And this is the aftermath of that ambush. And all of these photographs were possible only because we had invested so much time with the troops and that they trusted us. And in these really devastating moments for them when they lose one of their brothers, it's, it's very sensitive. And so we were allowed, I was allowed to photograph, I think because we had been with them for so long. In 2009, I won a MacArthur Fellowship, and it was the first time really in my career where I could photograph 
uh, without an assignment, without a commission. It was something I could choose the topic. And I wanted to do work on maternal death. And at that point in time, like 500,000 women were dying a year in childbirth. And I wanted to understand why. And so I started looking at maternal mortality. Afghanistan had one of the highest rates of maternal death in the world, as did Sierra Leone. Uh, in 2010, I went to Sierra Leone, and I started out trying to understand what were the reasons. Uh, in a place like Sierra Leone and Afghanistan, when a woman was in labor, she often had no access to doctors. Uh, there were very few roads, uh, very few doctors in, in locations, and a woman who was in labor or who wanted prenatal care had to walk for like eight hours just to get to the nearest clinic. So obviously many women for, didn't ever get prenatal care, and they only went to the hospital when there was a complication. I met Mama Cisse. Uh, she was 18 years old. This is her second pregnancy. She had been studying in high school. Her father took her out of school because he thought that it was time for her to become a mother. When I met her, she had given birth to twins. And the first baby was born, and the second baby wouldn't come out. Her sister, who was a midwife, sent an ambulance for her. And she finally, I talked to her at length in the hospital while she was in labor with the second baby. And she told me all about her school and her life. And finally, she delivered the second baby. And it was almost completely unresponsive. And so the midwives were very preoccupied with the baby and trying to save the baby. But of course, Mama Cisse started bleeding. Now, in this hospital, there was one doctor in the entire province. So I asked the midwives, where's the doctor? And they sort of laughed at me and said, well, he's in surgery. There's one doctor in the whole province. And so I went into surgery and put on scrubs and said, you know, I think there's a woman dying. She's bleeding a lot. And he sort of looked at me and was like, well, I'm busy. And I said, okay. So I went back and I said, I don't know, take her blood pressure. I'm not a doctor, but like we have to do something. And so they started taking her blood pressure. It was 60 over 30. And they decided to carry her over to the doctor. And by the time she got there, she was dead. And this is her funeral. And this story has, as tragic as it is, has a little bit of a happy ending because Time Magazine ended up publishing this story over eight pages. And one of the board members from Merck, the pharmaceutical, store, the pharmaceutical company, saw this story and he handed it out to all the board members during a meeting that they were talking about corporate responsibility. And they decided to put aside $500 million to fight maternal death. Uh, in part because of this story. Uh, I'll start the Libya uprising with a small video. And now some new information and disturbing information just into us. The New York Times now says that four of its journalists reporting on the conflict in Libya have gone missing. Four journalists, two reporters and two photographers for the New York Times disappeared on Tuesday. Editors say they have not heard from Anthony Shadid, Stephen Farrell, Tyler Hicks and Lindsay Adario. Four New York Times journalists were held captive. They'd been reporting from the eastern city of Ajabia. The Times executive editor says the paper has been in contact with the Libyan government and they were assured that the four would be released promptly if they had been captured. Libyan authorities said the group was captured in eastern Libya last week by forces loyal to Colonel Gaddafi. So in 2011, uh, the Arab Spring was taking root and I really wanted to cover it. Uh, I was in Iraq for National Geographic when Egypt was happening and so I offered to go to Libya. When I got to Libya, um, we had to cross in illegally through Egypt, um, much like many of the other wars I've covered. Libya, Gaddafi did not want journalists and did not want the world to see that there was a popular uprising against him. So all of the journalists who covered the uprising had to sneak in illegally through Egypt. And we knew that one of the greatest risks was bumping into Gaddafi's forces aside from the actual war. When I got there, there was this incredible sort of euphoria. People, young people were so excited about rising up against Gaddafi. And they were talking about starting this parallel government. And this is all in Benghazi in the east. And then there was a call to arms. And everyone decided that they would go forward on the front line and fight against Gaddafi's troops. And so we, as photographers, we have to be there to witness what's happening. We move forward with them. 
And immediately there was very heavy fighting. And on some days, uh, the, the rebels who we were with were taking ground back from Gaddafi's troops and they would celebrate. And on other days, it was uh, basically being against the entire Libyan military with helicopter gunships coming in above us, tank rounds, all sorts of artillery. Um, and it was terrifying because we were in the desert and there were days and days of very heavy combat. Uh, so we covered this. It was before the no-fly zone was in place. So Gaddafi had uh, aircraft, and he would drop these bombs just sort of anywhere where there were soldiers gathered. And we would just sort of cover the wounded and the dead. And on March 15th, after two weeks of covering the fighting, I was working with Tyler Hicks, Anthony Shadid, and Steve Farrell. And we knew that the town of Ajdabia was going to fall. We knew that Gaddafi's troops were coming in from the west, and the rebels were moving uh, up against them from the east. And as journalists, we have to make a decision how long to stay to cover something when we know it's increasingly dangerous. Because Gaddafi's troops, if they had caught us, they could imprison us for not having visas. So we were covering the fighting, and we were in two cars, and the driver of one car, his brother was shot at the front line, so he quit. And we ended up four New York Times journalists in one car. Now, everyone had a different idea of what they needed for the story. So some people wanted to go back to the hospital. Some wanted to go back to the front line. Meanwhile, the troops were moving closer and closer, and basically we stayed too long. And by the time we decided to move east to Benghazi, Gaddafi's troops cut the road, and we ran directly into one of those checkpoints. And immediately it was chaotic. They pulled us out of the car. Um, the rebels that we had been covering started opening fire on the checkpoint we were at, and there were bullets everywhere, and we had to make a run for it. And basically this is... Uh, the exact location where our car was stopped. I saw this building off in the distance, this small cement building. I knew I had to get behind it to stop, at least from the bullets killing us. So we all made a run for it and got to behind this building. At that moment, Gaddafi's troops came over and they were about to execute us. They tied our wrists together and our feet together and laid us face down in the dirt. And each one of us had a gun put to our heads. And they were about to kill us. And one of the commanders came over and said, you can't kill them, they're American. Now, we obviously don't know why that happened. But instead, uh, they decided to keep us for a week. And the first three days were brutal, uh, that we were tied up, blindfolded, beaten up, uh, threatened with execution repeatedly, uh, moved to a prison cell, thrown in the back of a pickup truck, and driven 600 kilometers under the hot sun while we were beaten every 45 minutes or so. And at the end of the week, we were uh, released in diplomatic talks. Um, the feeling is there was no ransom paid, but the feeling is Gaddafi wanted to prove that he was a legitimate leader, and he couldn't detain four New York Times people and hold us indefinitely, so we were released. Two weeks later, uh, the New York Times sent a team back to look for Mohammed, our driver, and they never found his body, and it's assumed he was killed in that moment. Um, but they found my shoe on the side of the road, which they had taken off my feet to tie me up with the laces. I'll show a short video here just to give you an idea of what it's like to work in the field. <laughs> Well, the prize-winning photojournalist Lindsay Adario has traveled the world covering the horror of war and its aftermath. This is the first time she's been to Myanmar. She's here to document the plight of the Rohingya Muslims, a minority forced into internal displacement. It's clear that it's very difficult to get access to the Rohingya and to photograph them. This community lives confined to a small strip of land on the western coast. The only semblance of freedom they experience is by the sea. They can't leave, they can't work, they know their boundaries. Like right next to them here on this side. 
In the hospital, things are much worse. It's almost impossible for anyone to get any sort of medical treatment. They're not allowed outside of the camp, so they just die. It's here that Lindsay meets Moriam Katu. When I first met her, she was sort of just leaning against this wall crying because she was so, she was in so much pain and and she just couldn't breathe. She basically knows she's dying a slow death and there's no one to help her. She decided to go home. Lindsay goes to the village looking for Moriam. People need to understand the plight of refugees and the fact that no one wants to leave their home and no one wants to be a refugee. This is something that is forced upon people. Can we come in? Can we come in? Finally, she finds Moriam. <sighs> She doesn't, uh, doesn't look good. Right. Only 10 days after we left, she died. So that was a video made um, by the Annenberg Space for Photography, and it was for a series on refugees with three photographers, and that was narrated by Kate Blanchett. I think it's important for you to see a little bit about how, uh, you know, what we deal with when we cover people's stories and, and how emotional it is and how difficult it is because we are you know, we're there to document and often I personally feel really sort of helpless in the face of what people are going through. Uh, a few years ago, I was given a grant by National Geographic to cover climate change. And so I'm just going to run quickly through some of this work. Um, I covered uh, with this grant, I covered the wildfires in California in the West. And my focus was really on how climate change is affecting women and children in particular. So I focused on, for example, female firefighters. And in the Amazon, where I took this photograph, I followed some indigenous female leaders who are starting to have a voice in um, illegal logging, mining, fishing, and things that affect the climate and the Amazon. And then I went to Ethiopia and covered the drought in Ethiopia and the floods in South Sudan, where uh, in 60 years they haven't had floods like this. Entire villages were completely flooded. And just in October, I went and covered the drought in Somalia. And it's incredible the amount of cattle families have lost. And these are cultures that are completely dependent on their animals. Uh, the malnutrition is outstanding. Uh, and this woman lost uh, two of her children in the past six weeks uh, when I met her, and she is standing over the body of one of her sons. And I'll just end with the war in Ukraine. This is my most recent work. I started, um, I went to Ukraine for the first time on February 14th, 10 days before the war started in 2022. Uh, I went for the New York Times. I had only worked there once before for a very short magazine assignment. Um, and 
when the war started, I personally didn't really believe the war would actually start. And when it did, uh, I ended up back in Kiev and stayed for about six weeks for the Times. This is Yulia who offered to fight. She was a school teacher um, and ended up offering herself up to fight for her country. Uh, this is in a maternity ward uh, in the very first few weeks. Uh, women living in the moldy basements, giving birth and taking care of their newborns down there. And this is the Irpin Bridge. Uh, Bucha and Irpin were both under siege by the Russians, and people were fleeing in mass over this broken bridge. The bridge had been broken by the Ukrainians to stop the Russian advance. And so there were people, it was a known uh, humanitarian evacuation route. And so it, scenes like this were being published all around the world. And so one morning I went there on March 6th, and I'll show a short video. So <laughs> So I had no idea what was on the other side of the street. This is what I'm seeing uh, as they're calling for a medic. I assumed it was a soldier. Uh, when Steve, our security advisor, finally allowed us to cross the street, uh, this is the scene that I came upon. And it was a family, uh, a mother and her two children who had been intentionally targeted by Russian forces on a known humanitarian evacuation route. And I realized the picture is very difficult and very graphic, but I felt very strongly that this picture had to be published because I felt that I witnessed the entire run up uh, I witnessed the rounds getting closer and closer, bracketing onto the, the the bridge, and everyone knew that that's where there were families fleeing for their lives. And so I uh, am grateful that the New York Times put it on the front page. As difficult as it is, it was evidence for me of intentional targeting of civilians. And this is people fleeing from, from uh, Mariupol, arriving in Zaporizhia in the south. And I've made seven trips or eight trips now uh, over the last 18 months. And these are just some of the scenes that I continue to see people living in basements, uh, civilians being injured. This is the liberation of Kherson in the south, uh, Ukrainian military in a bunker going through their drone footage where they hit uh, Russian targets, wounded soldiers. Uh, this is at a stabilization point. This was last week. Um, I've just come back from Ukraine late last night. I got home at about midnight last night, and the funerals for soldiers during the counteroffensive just go on and on. And this is a young girl being evacuated from her home uh, close to the front line, and this is at an artillery position yesterday or two days ago. So that's it. Um, I will just end with a lighter note. Uh, oh, actually, maybe I won't. My, this is my grandmother who died at 107, and I'll just play a short video because I know the material is very heavy. <laughs> Okay, so that's it. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Dario. That was it's it's stellar work. Um, 
there were two things that sort of stuck out to me. One was your comment about Life Magazine deciding not to publish that work. Um, for the historians, uh, during World War II, there weren't images of American soldiers who had been gravely wounded or killed that were published until Life Magazine published the first photographs, and that wasn't until, I think, 1943 or 1944. It's a, an image that George Strock made of um, three dead Marines on the, the, the beaches in the Philippines. So the fact that 60 years later, they were the first ones to say that they wouldn't publish those images is, is a little bit shocking there. Um, so I want to turn this over and see if there's some questions. Uh, we do have some folks here in the audience. Unfortunately, we can't turn the camera on them. So you don't get to see them, but you will get to hear them. Um, so who's got a question? All right, why don't you come on down? Okay. Um, I mean, I guess this is kind of a bit of a broad question, but you've seen so many, like, violent scenes and like so many like terrifying scenarios like what was your takeaway for it from all of it like do you have hope that like there'll be a day where there aren't these kinds of wars and whatnot can you turn around and face the oh stage? i'm sorry <laughs> yeah, okay. that's okay i just wanted to see um i i i do not have hope that there will be a day where there's never war I think that war, there will always be war somewhere. Um, but I have hope because, you know, I see really horrific things all the time, but I also see really beautiful things. And I think that the thing about war is that it strips everything away. And so you see, you know, incredible generosity and strength of character and resilience and people helping one another and survival, you know. And so I think that um, I, I don't believe that there will be peace around the world, you know, at any point. But I do think that um, with awareness, you know, people can get involved and try to, you know, prevent something like, well, obviously we couldn't prevent what happened with Russia invading Ukraine, but I think that, um, you know, at least the world is engaged and involved. And I think that, you know, it's important because it, the world is watching what's happening. And I think, obviously, there are limitations for various reasons on what can be done. But at least there there are some sort of boundaries of what, what Russia can do right now in terms of nuclear weapons and stuff like that. Uh, thank you so much. Again, I just want to say your work was um, really poignant and uh, meaningful. Thank you. thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Come on up. Yeah, and you gotta face the blue dot up there. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Hi. Um, yeah. Amazing, amazing photos. I feel really moved. Um, I remember that March 7th photo on the front page of the New York Times when it was in my front yard. And I remember thinking that you had documented a war crime and I'm curious then to know, what did you have you worked with the prosecutors in this way, providing this kind of evidence? And what kind of tribunal would there be for the woman that died in childbirth? And where would you show that evidence? So, so I did not work with, no one came to me for that image. I mean, it was used by um, the United Nations as sort of proof that civilians were being targeted. You know, it was talked about on the floor of the UN. Um, but no one has come to me specifically for that. And I think because what what happened two weeks later was Bucha. And I think the amount of war crimes that were so evident in Bucha, kind of every all of the evidence is being collected now. And I think that it's... Um, you know, my job as a journalist, um, you know, I think they have the evidence. The New York Times published it. And to me, that was the most important thing is that it's out there and it's published. And I witnessed the run up because it's one thing as a journalist to arrive on a scene after something's happened and try to sort of piece it together. But it's another thing to witness the fact that like subsequent rounds were coming in each closer than the previous one and that is bracketing. And so I know I've covered war long enough to understand when someone is trying to zero 
zero their artillery onto a target. And so, you know, I think it's it's up to people who are way above me to figure out what to do with this, but my job is to document. Great. Uh, I thought I saw one more hand. Come on over. Speak up to the blue dot that way. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you so much for uh, speaking to us. I was wondering, um, you've covered so many important historic moments. Uh, what do you want to cover next? Um, where do you want to be sent next? And what do you think like the big story that you'll cover next will be? I can't see you. Can you move closer to the podium? I just, oh, thanks. Hi. Um, hi. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I actually was asked that question in the um, symposium today. Um, I'm not sure. I think I am, I'm doing a lot of climate change stuff right now, which I think is really important. Um, and I'm sort of on the Ukraine rotation for the New York Times, although it's getting increasingly more difficult to cover things there um, because access is limited and it's you know, people are losing interest. So I'm always trying to find like a human angle on that story that will be compelling for people. Um, so I'm supposed to go to Afghanistan next month. Uh, it'll be the first time I've been back since the Taliban came back. Um, I sort of couldn't bring myself to go back after 20 years of, you know, having covered the Taliban the first time around and then covering all the progress and then it's just been emotionally very difficult to figure out what my work can contribute to a story like that, uh, given that the Taliban's back in power. So I haven't gone back, but I'm going back for a specific story. Um, so yeah, I don't really know. I mean, things kind of, I have a few different stories lined up, some I can't really talk about. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. All right, last chance. We've got time for one more question. Somebody's got to have it. All right, there you go. Come on up, Sam. Stare at the blue dot in the distance. Okay. <laughs> Hi, um, my name's Sam. Thank you for being here with us and sharing your career with us as well. Um, my question is more of a broader question about sort of the, the landscape of journalism, uh, past, present, and future. And I was wondering with, given your experience, how you feel the kind of the rise of news being disseminated on social media um, in regard to global conflict and war is gonna impact the way that people pay attention to news and conflict and specifically these heavier, more negative topics and maybe like how you feel um, kind of the, the field, like the direction that things are going and maybe your input on that or what you would like to see as far as like news literacy goes. Sorry, that was a mouthful. I mean, there's a lot of questions in there. Um, maybe I'll start with, I think social media, um, there are pros and cons. I think the cons are, that you know, people have to be aware that they can't just trust anything they see on social media, obviously. They have to sort of curate their news source. If they're gonna be getting news on social media, they should get it from trusted sources, like the New York Times, like the Associated Press, like you know, people who have been vetted over the years. And I think if you're getting it from individuals like local journalists in a conflict, you need to also know if they are trusted journalists because you know it's not just about taking a photograph it's about doing the reporting and presenting the facts and so i think that's really important um i think the pros are that you know if there's work that for example i shoot on assignment for the new york times and they don't publish it well then i have an instagram platform you know i have other ways to get that work out there and I think that that's really important and it's also for me important to engage with a younger audience or an audience that maybe doesn't read the New York Times cover to cover and so I think that there are you know there are definitely pros and cons of the social media but a lot of it for me has to do with making sure that um, you don't just trust everything you read that you have to understand like who you're following and why thank you 
Sorry for the mouthful <laughs> again. <laughs> I guess. No, it's all right. It's all right. All right, with that, I think we are going to go ahead and uh, and wrap up. Um, Isidario, thank you so much for joining us, not once, but twice, within 24 hours of your return yeah. home. Uh, we really do appreciate this, and, and we do hope that at some point in the future we can host you here in Athens, Georgia. Um, Absolutely. We would, we would love, love to have to you come. Uh, come visit our campus, visit our students, and spend a little bit of time with us. Um, uh, whenever thank whenever you. you're available, we would love to have you here. Uh, and with that, thank for the you folks so much. Are, thank you. Uh, and with that, for those of you in the audience, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you very much for, for coming today. Um, have a safe journey home, everyone. Thank you. Thanks again, Lindsay.